Well, it's snowing in the junkyard today, so I always say if you can't see them, don't try to show them. But in the meantime, enjoy this blast from the past. Hey, Steve Mignani here on the side of Route 67 in uh, Palmer, Massachusetts, doing the junkyard crawl, kind of. Well, I like planes, trains, and automobiles, and when it comes to trains, there's something called the Titanic Railroad, which is something that was going to go from Providence, Rhode Island to, oh, like Worcester, Massachusetts, or Boston. And I'm here on the side of Route 67 with a modern engineering marvel, the Mass Pike Overpass. Well, if we look right up here in the woods, we'll see something also amazing from 1912. That is the end, the bridge abutment for a proposed quarter mile long, 120 foot tall iron bridge that was going to link the Central New England Railroad. That thing hides in plain sight. Folks say, what is that concrete thing doing in the middle? Is that a bomb shelter? Is that a missile silo? No, it's part of the Titanic Railroad. Let's dig in. Continuing the story of the Central New England Railroad, that thing right there over my shoulder is one end of that proposed quarter mile long cast or steel bridge that was going to be built in 1912, 1913. Now that thing was made out of concrete back in 1912 or so. And the word is the Canadian Grand Trunk Railroad, not to be confused with Grand Funk Railroad, singers of We're an American Band from the 70s, different thing. The Grand Trunk Railroad wanted to take on the Boston and Albany Railroad, which ran here in New England. Well, they couldn't use the same right of way. That's like Coke and Pepsi or Hershey's and Nestle's sharing the same retail space. Doesn't happen. So they had to go over the Quaybog River, and this is the way they were going to do it. Now that big hunk of concrete right there has been standing there for 110 years. Uh, built in 1912. It's 2022 right now, so it's 110 years, right? So that was going to be the end of a bridge, the Horseshoe Curve, it was, it was called. And here's a picture over here of the the never happened horseshoe curve. So uh, it's an amazing thing. And the reality of it was that Charles M. Hayes, the president of the Canadian Grand Trunk Railroad, died on the Titanic. Uh, and the thing of it is that the Canadian funded railroad was supported in large part by British investors. So Charles Hayes was making his way back to the United States from Britain, where he was meeting with the investors. When he died, well, some say the railroad died with him. The reality is World War I kind of dried up the funds the British investors were going to pour into this thing, but that didn't stop them from continuing to build this, oh, this uh, boondoggle for the next several years. So all throughout New England, from say uh, Boston to Providence, Rhode Island, throughout the countryside are dotted weird relics from a railroad that never was. Let's keep looking. As we continue our look at the Horseshoe Curve, you got to remember this thing was built between 1910, 11, 12 uh, here in New England. And again, here's a picture of that what if almost was bridge. This thing was going to be a quarter mile long and these iron footings, these supports right here, the feet of these things were going to fit onto concrete pylons, which we see right here in the woods. Now, people have come through here on snowmobiles and cross-country skiers in the wintertime say, is that a missile silo? Is that like the orb from 2001, Stanley Kubrick's movie? What is that thing? There's not one, there's one, two, three, four. And throughout the woods here, they dot this place like Morse code. Well, these were going to be the footings for the iron legs to this bridge. Can you imagine? You've got to keep in mind, these are the feet, the actual bridge and the rail bed was going to be up about 100 feet. And this is back in the day, 1912, when they didn't weld. It was going to be a big riveted bridge. And these are the pylons that were going to support that bridge. Let's look closer. These cement pylons that were going to support the legs of that iron bridge are huge. And what you're going to keep in mind, again, these things were poured back in 1911, 12, 13, here in the woods of Palmer, Massachusetts. And they go down about 15 feet into the ground. And the word is that the Grand Trunk Railroad of Canada hired Portuguese and Italian laborers from overseas. And they hired them, they put them up in a moving camp that made its way from Providence to Boston. Austin. And uh, as they made their way through the, here, these fellows made these things. They dug down 10, 15 feet, created a hole, and started working their way up. And you can see the wooden forms and the different pour levels right here, where these things were slowly created, level by level, making their way up. And the wooden forms that made these things are probably in the dust at our feet right now. But here's the thing. This is just a small part of the bridge. Over here is the Quaybog River. It goes down a good 500 feet into a valley. How did they handle that? 
let's keep looking. Down here, oh, about 400 feet down is the Quaybog River, been there since the Ice Age. And on the other side of it is the Boston and Albany Railroad, which has been there since 1857 or so. And again, the Canadian Grand Trunk Railroad with their Southern New England Railway was going to take on the Boston and Albany. So Boston and Albany was not into this. So this bridge was gonna be a way to go around and over, not just the river, but also the competing Boston and Albany Railway. But to get over this, this river, how are they gonna do it? This is a problem. And here's the solution. That's the Quaybog River. We're now on the other side of it. And again, the cement pylons continue. And we can see here that they actually installed a couple of pylons in the actual water. Now, I'm not sure if they built a coffer dam and obstructed the flow of the river. I doubt it, but somehow, some way, back in 1911 or 12 or 13, whatever it was, the workers sunk those into the ground. Now, these things weren't brought here on a truck or by a helicopter. They were made on site. And remember, 1912, 13, there was no rebar. These were purely cement or concrete, whatever you want to call it, gravel type stuff, made on site. And again, by building these pylons, there was going to be iron legs and the bridge would have gone over our heads about 100 feet high, a quarter mile from that end, over the railway, over the river, to the other end. Now, speaking of the railway, this is the Boston and Albany Railway right here. Uh, back in the 70s and before, this was two directions, two rails. Uh, it's been shrunk down, but every single day, Amtrak comes through here, freight trains come through here. It's still very active. But again, this is owned by the, 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 the bitter enemy of the Grand Trunk Railroad and the Southern New England Railroad Project. Again, it was funded largely by British investors uh, who in 1912-13 were ready to take on and make money in New England with trains. Well, the trouble is, by that point in time, trucking and roads were really starting to take over, put a bite in the railroad industry. And beyond that, World War I, 1914, uh, the British investor money dried up. And beyond all that stuff, Charlie Hayes, the president of the Canadian Grand Trunk Railroad, died on the Titanic. Now, some say the gold bars sank with him. None of that. He was the manager, and when he died, a lot of the impetus for the program died with him. But they kept building. And here's the thing. These pylons continue in that direction. But here's the thing. If you look up there, there's a really tall bit of soil. Well, this is a picture right here. Let's get off the rails. I don't want to get run over. And rail safety, folks, always don't stand around on railroad tracks. But with that said, this is a picture right here from about 1911 or so. And that, that dirt, and here are the pylons right here. We're standing right here, right now. And if you look over there, out in the woods, there's a really high spot. How on earth was that iron bridge going to merge over to that? Let's take a look. Okay, we saw one end, the concrete abutment near the Mass Pike of where that big quarter mile long bridge was gonna meet. The other end was up there. That big concrete thing up in the air looks like, you know, the monolith or some weird ancient aliens kind of a thing. Well, here's the thing. Here's a picture back in about 1911. And this is the scene over my shoulder. That cement goes all the way down to the normal ground level and then they built soil around it. That is the rail bed up top where the train was gonna go into Brimfield, Massachusetts. And if you ever went to the Brimfield Flea Market, that classic three times a year swap meet antique show that draws people from all over the planet, Brimfield is where uh, that railway was going on its way toward Providence, Rhode Island. So let's take a hike into the woods and go and check out that thing. Okay, here we are on the top of the abutment, the other side of a quarter mile long, 110 foot tall iron bridge that never happened. But here again, we're standing on the top of this thing right here. And if we look out that way, that is the airspace that was going to be spanned or covered by the Horseshoe Curve Bridge. They never got finished, but they got this far back in 1911, 1912. It's crazy. Now, the other side of the coin is once they built the bridge, that's only part of the picture. Now, we go here, we can see the sort of an unnatural flat area. That's the rail bed. This goes all the way to Brimfield, Mass, and beyond that to Providence, Rhode Island, through Sturbridge, Mass, Southridge, Mass, Brimfield. And uh, it's an amazing 
amazing thing. It was a feat of engineering uh, and, and greed, frankly. Uh, apparently the word is the management at the Grand Trunk Railroad was fully aware that the business case for this thing was kind of dead, and especially after World War I and British money dried up. But the money they had from the investors, they kept building, even though they knew it wasn't going to go anywhere. This is a book by Larry Lowenthal, a Brimfield resident, <clears throat> done about 1998, tells the whole story about the Southern New England Railroad. And again, this is not a junkyard crawl, but if it involves cars, trains, planes, I'm in. And this is kind of like finding a drag strip out in the woods. That happens too, and people care about it. So that's the story of the Southern New England Railway, or just a small piece of it, and the horseshoe curve that never came to pass. But if you like this video, and we'll be doing more junkyard, we'll be doing more car stuff, but this kind of, it was just a cool thing. Uh, but if you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the Steve Mags YouTube channel.